Hello YouTube. What quest was shared by secret police and forces of the National Socialist Germany, the SS Special Units, and also by the NKVD and the KGB secret police of the Soviet Socialist regime? Also some secret societies, as well as run-of-the-mill adventurers and treasure hunters. What were they looking for in the freezing north of what is today modern Russia? It was the golden chalice or the golden ball of the Vikings. No, they did not find the chalice. But people of the north, they talk amongst themselves. And still, and one can hear talk and rumors, like someone saw it, it's lying there in the Belomorsk district. There is a little more actually to modern discoveries. And we'll get to it. But let me start. A long, long time ago, a Viking ship sailed the White Sea. So let's start from the beginning. A hidden secret, so secondary goal of Nicholas Rorik's trip to the town of Serdabol, now Sortavala, emerges from the depth of memory. The great artist and mystic and most likely Soviet spy in the later years, while still he was in what was called Petrograd and later Leningrad and now back to St. Petersburg, he was, and he was seriously engaged in archaeology and ancient history. He gleaned information about the golden chalice of the Vikings and its possible location in some secret sources. Reportedly, Nicholas Rorik used them when planning an expedition to the east, to the Himalayas. And I told you about those, the, uh, that expedition in my other videos. He pointed out that these sources go back to the oldest and authentic documents. The documents already known in the Middle Ages, allegedly they fell to the Templars and after the destruction and prohibition of the order they became the property of the secret societies. They are still stored somewhere. The history of the legend of the golden chalice of the Vikings is so mysterious that it seems to some in Russia that archaeologists and ethnographers are afraid to touch this issue. To shed light on the exciting adventures, we need to immerse ourselves in the legends and history of the Russian region. This amazing, mysterious and strange story goes back to the distant past. During the triumph of paganism, when Christianity was practically unknown in the Russian north, in the deepest darkness of antiquity, individual Finnish, like from Finland, migrants, uh, which later formed a separate people of the Chud Zavolotskaya, occupying the Dvina river system, now located in the Arhangelsk region. They sm spread many small settlements there. It was a special tribe of Finnish origin, distinguished from other tribes, related to it by strict settlement, self-government, high intellectual development and a beautiful capital city, international trade and most importantly a special shrine of their pagan cult. The very name Zavolotskaya Chud appeared um, due to the Novgorodians and pointed to the northern population who lived behind long impassable water rapids and was associated with the need to drag boats or carry them. I'll get to this later. As for the fabulous city of Novgorod, I'll tell you about it later. I have a special affinity for that city. According to historical evidence and traditions, it is known that the religion of ancient Chud consisted in the veneration of the supreme god, god Yumala. He was worshipped by the ancient Karelians. Uh, people of the uh, Finnish origin. The very name of Yumala denotes a god who lives in heaven. The Russian historian Yefiminko wrote that the idol of the god Yumala, made very skin skillfully from the best wood, was decorated with gold and precious stones that brightly illuminated everything around. On Yumala's head shone a golden crown with twelve rare stones. On his knees stood a huge golden chalice filled with gold products, artifacts and coins. His clothes were worth more than the cargo of the richest ship. The memorial book of the Kurostrovsky church in the Arhangelsk region 
in the year 1887 adds the following it was impossible to steal money or the idol because the Chuj was firmly guarding their god. Sentries were constantly standing around him, and so that they would not miss any thieves. Springs were held near the idol itself. Who would touch the idol with at least one of his finger? Now the springs will start playing. All sorts of bells will ring, and you won't go anywhere. The sentries will run up, right right away well such was the elaborate security system of the times uh, full of wires and all other contraptions what era the pagan god appeared here legends do not say however it is known that this happened much earlier than the huge acquaintance with the novgorodians this is the time of the formidable vikings who already in the ninth century directed their sight to the north partly with militant and partly with commercial purposes. As for Novgorod, I'll tell you, the Novgorod Republic was a medieval state from the 12th to the 15th centuries, stretching from the Gulf of Finland to the west of the northern Ural Mountains in the east, including the city of Novgorod and the Lake Ladoga regions of modern Russia. Citizens refer to the city-state as His Majesty or Sovereign, Lord Novgorod the Great, Novgorod Veliki. The Republic prospered as the easternmost port of the Hanseatic League and its Slavic, Baltic and Finnish people were much influenced by the culture of the Viking Varangians and the Byzantine people. In the middle of the 9th century, Nevo Gardas was a name used to describe Viking staging posts on the trade route from the Baltic Sea to the Byzantine Empire. In 1882, Prince Alek founded the Kievan Rus, where I am from, of which Novgorod was a part from then until ten year, from years 1019 to 120. 1020. The Novgorod princes were appointed by the Grand Prince of Kiev, usually one of the other sons. The Republic was the subject of political rivalry between Poland and Lithuania on one side and the Grand, Grand Duchy of Moscow on the other side in the 14th and 15th centuries. The Novgorod Republic managed to escape the horrors of the Mongol invasion because it was the only Rus principality that was never conquered by the Mongols. In the 14th century, raids by Novgorod pirates or Ushkuiniki sowed fear as far as the Kazan and Astrakhan, assisting Novgorod in wars with the Muscovy or Moscow. In the 12th to 15th centuries, the Novgorodian Republic expanded east and northeast. The Novgorodians explored the areas around Lake Onega, along the northern Vina, and coastlines of the White Sea. At the beginning of the 14th century, the Novgorodians explored the Arctic Ocean, the Barents Sea, the Kara Sea, and the West Siberian River Ob. Reaching the Ugrian tribes, they inhabited the northern U that inhabited the northern Urals. This was a goal of Novgorod the Great, although relations were exceptionally difficult. Remember the Golden Woman series that I made videos of? You, you should look it up too, it's very interesting, it ties in. The lands to the north of the city, rich with furs, sea fauna, salt, were of great economic importance to the Novgorodians who fought a protracted series of wars with Moscow, beginning in the late 14th century, in order to keep these lands. Losing them meant economic and cultural decline for the city and its inhabitants. Indeed, the ultimate failure of the Novgorodians to win these wars led to the downfall of the Republic. So. If you look at it, Russia really had a feudal political system parallel to that of the medieval West. The city-state of Novgorod had developed procedures of governance that held a large measure of democratic participation far and in advance of the rest of Europe, and also sharing several similarities with the democratic traditions of the Scandinavian peasant republics. The people had the power to elect city officials, and they even had the power to elect and fire the prince. Well, in 1478, the Russian great prince of Muscovy, Ivan III, sent his army to take the city. He destroyed the Vecchi, or parliament. He tore down the Vecchi bell, bell, 
the ancient symbol of participatory governance, civil society and legal rights. He destroyed the library and archives, thus ending the independence of Novgorod. Listen, there has been so much paranormal phenomena in that area for centuries, I think for millennia. I think it was in a way like the Alexandria Library destruction, so much has gone down it's consumed by fire. Well, after the takeover, Prince Ivan took most of the Novgorod's land, half for himself, the rest for his allies. The Muscovite despotism and tyranny won, and the Russian city of freedom, and possibly West European-like, or even better, development, it was lost. But let's get back to the treasures. Up to the 12th century, entire expeditions were equipped in Norway, which made their way across the Arctic Ocean and the White Sea to the Chud Zavalotskaya lands to acquire wealth to barter and predatory attacks. The nature of these campaigns can be judged by a number of remaining historical documents. Around 1920, says a Norwegian chronicle, a certain Eric made a campaign to Chud, won a great victory over the natives and returned to Norway with a rich booty. The son of this Eric, Harald, went on a campaign in 964. He also won many victories and returned home with a huge um, booty of gold, silver, and other goods. A campaign in uh, the year 1025 and 1026 by one of the courtiers of King Olaf, the noble Kork and his brother Gunstein became particularly famous. Well, listen to that. They stuck up on goods and by the order of the king they went to try their luck in Chuj Zavolotskaya. They passed safely on ships at the mouth of the northern Dvina and received a good profit from their trade. But this did not seem enough to them and they remembered the temple of Yumala. So the Scandinavians decided to break through their, to take possessions of the sacred treasures. Some of them remained to guard the ships, and the others headed towards the forest in the evening, marking their way with bark stripped from the tree trunks. After midnight, they came to a clearing where there was a temple surrounded by a high rear with a tightly locked gate. Uh, it was guarded by six natives who changed during the night. The Vikings managed to attack the temple just during the night shift that was slowed down for some reason. They seized so much gold that it was no longer possible for them to carry it away. But excessive greed ruined the brave robbers. Gunstein returned to Yumal and stole a cup filled with gold coins standing on the idol's knees. He poured the gold into the bosom um, of his clothes and took the cup of chalice in his hands, intending to flee. Seeing this cork rush to Yumala and seeing a thick gold necklace around his neck, to his axe and cut the chain. This blow turned out to be so strong that the severed head of the idol flew to the side. At the same time, there was such a harm that it seemed like a miracle to everyone. An alarm was raised in the forest. The Jews rushed to the defense of their temple and surrounded the Scandinavians, who did not have time to hide in the forest with their prey. They had to fight their way to their ships by sword and cunning. Some of them, led by their leaders, escaped and reached the White Sea, but were caught in a storm at the and they had to hide from the wind on the shore. However, the Chute continued the pursuit. Gunstein and Cork, with a small detachment, moved inland, looking for salvation, but foreseeing the inevitable, they hid all the treasures in a small lake. Legends showed that even captured Vikings did not say a word about the place where the treasures were buried underwater. We assume they were interrogated and tortured. Since then, various groups and expeditions have been looking for the treasures. Since the value is fabulous beyond belief, it is also believed that the chalice itself has magical properties. There are legends that the locals found a variety of gold objects scattered along the shore of the White Sea in a significant area. Be they as it may, be that as it may, research continues in the hope of someday solving this centuries-old mystery. Let's now look at the Chute people. 
the fate of the people under the strange name Chud the White-Eyed, Chud who has white eyes, still remains one of the most controversial mysteries um, of the Russian history. Even though the Chud left its traces everywhere, in the names of lakes and villages, in the fairy tales and proverbs, in the archaeological cultural layer, this tribe simply disappeared from the face of the earth. Or did they? Who is the Chud Zavolotskaya? According to the overwhelming majority of historians, the Chud is nothing more than a collective concept by which the ancestors of the modern Russians meant the totality of some of the Ugro-Finnish tribes. The language of these strangers was incomprehensible to the Russians, alien, and therefore they were called as Chud or Marvel, wonder in Russian, but also in the old Russian language, Chud refer to aliens, the root of the word Chujoy. Not space aliens, but just some, someone who is alien. Representatives of this mysterious tribe resided in the territories where representatives of the Finnish Ugric people still predominate among the population. Chuj um, was the name that the inhabitants of Zavalochia the land lying within the boundaries of the basins of two rivers, the northern Vina and Anega. In ancient times, it was necessary to drag ships from one river to another manually, by dragging or by volok. Similarly, the land areas between the two water spaces began to be called voloki, hence the Zavolochia behind the drag. A Soviet scientist archaeologist Brusov believed that the Zavolotsky um, region was inhabited by the first people about three to four thousand years ago. This is evidenced by the remains of tools and utensils found because of excavations. Moreover, according to historians, all the items are made very skillfully. What were the reasons for the disappearance of the Chuj? A number of scientists claim that the Zavolotska Chuj has not gone anywhere. It's just that the representatives of this tribe assimilated with other ethnicities, Karelians, Veps, Russians. By the way, there is a rumor in Russia that Vladimir Putin is one of the, he's of the Veps ethnicity. He looks like them. Being pagans, they nevertheless adopted Christianity on an equal basis with others, and having united with the newly converted, simply dissolved among them, adopting their writing, because the Chud did not have it all. However, some researchers believe that the Zavolotska Chud just did not want to be baptized, because these people were ardent pagans and did not want to deviate from their faith in any way. Even many years after the spread of the new religion in Russia, the representatives of the Chud kept their appearance, indicating, for example, the loose hair of women, uh, and thus they showed that they had not given up on paganism. Especially, a lot of references to Chud can be found in fairy tales and stories of the old believers, uh, Russian Christian religious dis dissidents from the 18th century. So, in one of these stories, it is said that a certain white king, white czar, who decided to conquer a mysterious tribe and gathered a huge army for this. However, the Chu did not want to obey this king and descended deep underground, where they live to this day. They built roads and cities there. Only sometimes, in complete silence, you can hear the bells ringing in underground temples. But the day will come when the Chu will come to the surface again. According to another legend, the representatives of the Chud really rejected the new alien um, Christian faith for them and realizing that they were doomed committed mass suicide. They dug a huge depression in the ground, installed poles there and put a roof on them after which they went down into this pit and knocked out the supports. They were covered with fragments of the roof. None of the Chud tribes survived. Chud Zavolotska is the ancient pre-Slavic population of Zavolotia. And like I said, it's still a kind of historical mystery to this day. The, this term was, it is said, put in use by the chronicle of the 11th century, Nestor in the tale of bygone years. I often refer to this in my research 
other videos. Enumerating the peoples of Eastern Europe and his work, he named this ethnicity among other uh, Finnish Ugric tribes of the time. In the affet of part, Russia, Chud, and all pagans said, Meria, Murom, Mordvins, Zavolotska, Chud, Perm, Pechera, Yam, Ugra. Historians claim that the Chud was people who did not possess writing and left behind no chronicle or any other documents. They have not survived as people, have not left their customs or language to this day. The Chud has disappeared without a trace. Well, they say among the Russian newcomers and neighboring peoples. Only the legends and names given to the rivers and lakes among which they lived remind us of the lost tribes. We know that the people called by the Novgorodians, the Chud Zavolotskaya, well, like I said, they lived in the basins of the Mezin and the northern Dvina rivers, also along the banks of the Luza, the Yug, and the Pushma. But the language and culture, yeah, they belong to the Finnish Ugric people. And at one time, the Finno Ugric or Finnish Ugric people inhabited the entire northeast of the Urals and part of Asia. I don't know if you know, but Hungarians arrived in Eastern Europe from the Urals. Well, the Chu, they spoke a language close to the language of the modern Veps and Karelians. All information about the life, clothing, and appearance of the Chu tribes is known only from the results of archaeological excavations. I mean, concrete information. Archaeologists usually search in an area with some kind of chewed name. They find either traces of a village, a settlement, or a chewed burial ground, like ancient cemetery. According to the finds, it is possible to determine uh, whether it was a chewed or another Finnish Ugric tribe, or Scandinavians and Slavs who came to this land later, and there were many battles over the control. You watch uh, a series about Vikings and so forth, so you imagine. You imagine how it was happening at that time. They were people of medium and above average height, those Chud, presumably fair-haired and with light eyes, in appearance most resembling modern Karelians and the Finns. Chud and other Finns can be confidently distinguished from, other, from others by the two types of finds, by the remains of their pottery and jewelry. Pottery is usually made without a potter's wheel, by hand, with thick walls. Often it has not a flat but a round bottom, because the food in, in which it was cooked, it was cooked not in stoves, but in hearths or an open fire. On the outside, such dishes are decorated with ornaments, squeezed out on raw clay with the help of sticks and special stamps. Um, such an, an ornament is called a pet comb and is found only among the Finno Ugric people. Because of the appearance, there is another name for these people. I'll repeat the white eyed chud. Well, the, those two tribes, they knew pottery, blacksmithing, they were able blacks, blacksmithing, they were able to weave, process wood and bone. They became familiar with metal, but not so long ago in historical terms, because most of the tools were made of bone and flint, and that's what was found in settlements. They also lived by hunting and fishing. They were also engaged in agriculture, growing unpretentious northern crops, oats, rye, barley, flax. They kept pets, although during the excavations of settlements in the Zavalochia, archaeologists find more bones of wild animals than domestic ones. They hunted not only for meat, those chewed, but also fur-bearing animals. Furs in those days were used along with money. You could buy stuff with that. It was also just a commodity. It was traded with Novgorod, with Scandinavian, and with the Volga Bulgaria. If you watch my videos, you will recognize some of the names I mentioned here, connected with ancient UFO sightings and other paranormal phenomena. Uh, so the Jew disappeared with the advent of Christianity, and as you know, their own religion was pagan. But I have told you before of another Chud people, the ones of the Ural Mountains mostly. In the old days and in the Urals, the legend again of the wide-eyed Chud was also spread of unnamed people who lived in ancient times along the banks of the Ural rivers and lakes. When plowing, plowing the land, peasants often, often found Chud 
artifacts, tools, weapons, jewelry, utensils. So at the end of the last century, iron and silver daggers were found on arable land near the Kaminka River. And in 1903, a peasant by the name of Fyodorov found a bronze knife with a copper handle in these places. Traces of the white-eyed chewed were found in almost every village there. These were ancient settlements with ramparts and moats. Ancient graves, mounds or Ural uh, Kurgani attracted the attention of people, causing them superstitious fear. There were rumors among the people about untold treasures buried in the mounds. In the 17th century, during the period of settlement of the Urals and Siberia by the Russians, or you could call it conquest, like conquistadores in South America, predatory excavation of, of mounds for the purpose of gold prospecting was widely spread among the peasants. Grave graves containing skeletons of the buried and objects placed with the dead. People believed that the mounds they had excavated were not graves of the ancient Ural people, but dugouts, dwellings of the unknown Chute people. In the Ural legends about the white-eyed Chute is told, and they say that the Chute was really a small people. These people live in dugouts. When the Chu turned out, found out that the white king wanted to conquer them, they cut down the pillars of their dugouts and buried themselves. So you see, just like the Chu Zavolotska, of course, there's a connection. And I told you about the Sirta people before. Well, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote that in the high Hyperborean Mountains, as he called the Ural Mountains, live Hyperboreans, Isidons, Sarmatians. Perhaps the legendary Chudi of the Urals belong to this mythical people. And the Sirtia, that's in other videos about the strange people of the underground uh, who, who went underground to live beneath the surface of the earth in the Urals. As for the possible location of that chalice of the treasures, well, in 2020, thanks to the large-scale international projects, complex humanitarian research in the White Sea Basin, Russian archaeologists and a team with their Norwegian and Swedish colleagues have unearthed the real mysteries of history. The Solovetsky Archipelago comprises six islands in the western part of the White Sea, covering about three um, I think about 600 or more kilometers. They have been inhabited since the 5th century BC and important traces of a human presence from as far back as the 5th millennium BC uh, can be found there. The archipelago has been the site of fear and monastic activity since the 15th century. And there are several churches dating from the 16th to the 19th centuries. The Solovetsky archipelago turned out to be rich in artifacts. Archaeologists found 35 spiral shaped underground stone labyrinths there. And this is really the most intriguing mystery of the Biarmian civilization. One can only guess what or whom the structures were intended for. According to some sources, the borders of Biarmia stretch from the northern Dvina to the Pechora and from the White Sea to the Kama River. According to others, its borders were even wider and reached Finland in the west, Norway in the north seizing the White Sea coast and the Kola Peninsula in the territory of the entire Russian North. Remember my videos about the Kola Peninsula. And if you like mysteries of that area, please watch them. The Biarmia was followed by the imaginary and fantastic country of Jutunheim, the land of giants, the homeland of horrors of nature and evil sorcery. The Novgorod Chronicle mentions that the Normans, Murmans, uh, repeatedly raided the Zavalochia, belonging to the Veliki Novgorod. The clashes between the Russians and the Normans were mainly due to the fishing in the Dorn Northern Sea. The inhabitants of Zavalochia even paid tribute to Norway and sometimes raided the Norwegian lands themselves. All this proves that the sea route from Norway to Russia was used in the Middle Ages and at least on the shores of the northern Dvina, the Scandinavians in the 10th to 15th centuries, they really appeared. 
In addition to the labyrinths and Solovki, there were ruins of pagan altars, totems, sanctuaries and giant stones clearly oriented to the coordinates of the stars and constellations that the Biarmians worshipped. According to experts, it was the Solovetsky Islands that were the center of the pagan civilization of Biarmia, and it was here that the mysterious rituals were regularly performed in honor of Mother Goddess, the ancestor of all living things in the pagan beliefs. And there are strange mazes that resemble those depicted on ancient Minoan coins and more. And I've talked about it too. So that it is possible that the location of the ancient treasures is on those islands. So that's what I wanted to let you know today. If you like my research, please support it. You'll find the links in the description to this video. And I'll tell you more about ancient and modern mysteries of Eurasia and other parts of the world. Please like my channel, please subscribe to it, and please tell others. And thank you for, to all those who support me.